Hi, I am still fiddling, but I'm here. It's Friday, it's Friday afternoon thought flow. Ooh, it's been a week, quite a week. So much happening in the world and I'm so ecstatic about our guest today. Um, because, well, for so many reasons, I'm mean, so excited about our guest today, but one of the biggest reasons is because this human being has done so many good things in the world and continues to do so. But, um, you know, those of us that know him from Pilates land have him kind of pigeonholed into this little Pilates box. And we know how Pilates boxes can be sometimes. So I'm really excited to talk with him and, of course, my partner in parlance, Nikki, about what's going on in his world and uh, have him share a little bit about the other parts of himself. So I'm going to let Nikki in first. Hi, guys. Hmm. Maybe I'll let Nikki in. Hmm. Nikki, I see you, but I don't see you. In the meantime, hi, Tammy, welcome. Hi, Josephine. Hello, Kevin. Oh, it's going to be good today. Even my hair is feeling perky because it's so excited about this conversation. But, um... I don't know what's happening here. So I'm going to send her a note. People are starting to trickle in and wave. In the meantime, uh-oh, pardon me, we have a technical moment. So hi, Lindsay, give me a second. We're gonna try to figure this out here on this end. In the meantime, lots going on in terms of trials around the country. Uh, I don't like to talk about such heinous negativity, but in real life, this is kind of what we have to do. And I must say in both of the major trials happening, the Rittenhouse trial and the murder of Gabriel Aubrey, really, really disgusting things have been happening. And um, one of the, the worst things you know, what Nikki is having an issue. So I'm just going to bring Kevin right in and he and I can talk about it. Lindsay, glad you could make it today. Thank you for coming. I'm going to bring Kevin Bowen up. Hello, Harmony. So, uh, yeah, I was... Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm on a news blackout, but I would say that it's more of a, like a gray out. I'm only watching things as they come up in, in places where I can get just little nits, nits, snits of news. And um, when I saw yesterday that um, in the Aubrey murder trial that the Hi, Kevin. Welcome, Hi. welcome. Um, so I was saying, when I saw yesterday, I don't know if you, you caught this, but in the uh, murder of um, Ahmed Aubrey's trial yesterday, they, the prosecution, I'm sorry, the defense requested that there be no more, what did he call them? I think he may have just said pastors in his first pass through. No more black pastors should be allowed to sit with the family of Mr. Aubrey because that looked like intimidation to him and therefore to his clients as well. I, I, I didn't see that, but that's seriously. Can you believe? <laughs> <laughs> what? 
I, that's like, what, why? What difference does it make? Who sits with them? What, what kind of intimidation? Are they holding guns? Well, I mean, seeing as their clients chased someone down as he was on a jog and shot him dead. I mean, it's, it's hilarious that a couple of pastors sitting across a, a hello, across a room from them could be intimidating to them. Uh, this one of, I haven't really been watching a lot of news pseudo sort of on purpose. Um, and then I just try to read what I read on the news feed, and um, I just, it's, it's all more of the same, it sounds like. <sighs> more of the same? I don't know. I almost feel like that's an escalation. I mean, it's always been a thing where people could have clergy sitting with the, the, the families to say, oh, no, now all of a sudden this is intimidation. And when we have an all white jury, well, I'm sorry, there's one black soul on the jury. How, I mean, how are these people being intimidated? Nikki, welcome. Are you feeling intimidated? I am by my electronics right now. <laughs> you do seem to be having a moment. Um, I, I think that that is just, I think that that is just classic. Um, you know, I never know anyone's name. Who is who is the woman who was on? Um, there's, you know, there's all this stuff that's um, been written. It's a good thing that black people aren't asking for um, revenge or vengeance or just ask, asking for equity. Um, and we talk about all of these different ways um, that black people do, but could do more to come together. I think that what you are describing is, I think it is, it is intimidation because there is the understanding that when um, black people are together, uh, we are a force. We are a force of nature. We are a force to be reckoned with. And um, I think that there may be a fear in terms of when there are too many black people coming together and when you have what we have, which we haven't which we didn't have prior to, right? There was no social media. There was not this easy access to news and things that are going on. All of these things that we're experiencing, they have been going on for decades. They didn't really stop. It is just our awareness because everything is so accessible, you know, in terms of uh, somebody's there. They have this, you know, fabulous device in their hand that records voice, records video, you can take photos. So I don't think that anything is different in terms of, it, is it escalating? I don't, I don't necessarily feel like things are escalating. I feel like they're just more accessible. So I think that there are probably some white people who are like, oh shit, what if the black people actually did decide to like, you know, get together, come together? Um, it's a projection of a response. It's a, it's a, they're projecting, right? Because they know that what happened to Ahmad Aubrey was egregious and gross. They know that. They know that they killed a black man because they were white and they thought they'd get away with it. They, their what, what was their um, civilian, uh, c you know, citizens arrest? You know, I'm like, you know, it was like. You know, they, they, they were a bunch of good old boys, you know, pickup truck and fatigues to boot. They were a bunch of good old boys who saw a black man who probably looked like he had just a wee bit too much fundage for their taste. Um, how can you be out in your cute white shorts taking your run? How dare you, you know, take a run? How, how dare you? You know, how dare you have enough time to maintain your physical health and attributes and you know, God forbid my wife should see you because she might want to sleep with you. So, no, nah, we're going to take that. <laughs> Jeez, this is really okay. down the drain. <laughs> that's that, but that's, but I mean. That, that's an interesting storyline, but okay. It's yeah. not, if you it's think not. about it, could be very true. true. That's it's the true. That's the true. That's the buck on the block. Right. Like that, the prowess of the black man. Who just right. happens to be on a run. Like, I don't think <laughs> he was looking for anybody's wife at the time, but. No, yeah, I, 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 no, I get what you're saying, though. Yeah. It, it's this narrative that's not even generated by the victim that these people have put into their minds and then they, they, you know, they act on it and then they want special dispensation because they were under duress. It was so hard. 
It's absurd. It is. That's the dude absurd. driving a Porsche, and and you know the guy who who has worked decades in um, equity. He gets the job, and they're like, mm, "No, nope, haha, J.K." And the real estate agent driving him around is like commenting on his rental car. You know, it's like, like, oh, it must be a rental car because certainly you're not. You know, like you're mad because he can afford a Porsche. And it's like that's what it is. It's like you, you know, stay in your lane, black man. Stay in your lane. That's not your lane. Well, and it all comes back to Kevin. Welcome. It all comes Hi, Kevin. <laughs> back to this idea of human rights and who deserves rights, who's considered to be a human. Why is it that there are certain assumptions made that almost give a pass to people for denying people's human rights, as we're about to see in the Rittenhouse trial, and we can talk about that later. But Kevin, I would love for you to introduce yourself and your work to people who maybe only know you as Kevin Pilates guy or people who don't even know that much about you. Okay. Um, well, I guess most people must know my background with Pilates. So that's part of who I am. Um, and when I moved to Santa Fe, um, here's a quick synopsis. Um, I went to our pride event and it was kind of dismal. And I thought, uh oh, we lost Nikki. Ah, she'll be back. Okay. And I thought, well, okay, it should be a little nicer because it's a nice town. So I did what I typically do, which is I volunteered to get involved with the organization. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can fix this. I'll do it. So, um, and then I did. And before I knew it, I became the president of the organization because it had so many problems leading up to the time that I got involved. Um, and this all kind of fits together um, with Pilates a little bit, but I got involved with, you know, the Human Rights Alliance here. It was an older organization and should have been um, doing its original mission. It's been, we've been around since 1993 and we were started in the state in order to initially provide a suicide prevention health line for everybody, human rights, and uh, more specifically uh, to fight for uh, legislation for health and equity for AIDS and all the people who were getting sick, because it was 1993. Um, and it was started by a, a group of you know, pretty progressive people here in our state, the uh, first lesbian out, any gay, any LGBTQ person you want to think of, legislator who was um, brought into state government in 1991. Um, and so, Fast forward, it became kind of a boys club organization and that needed to be fixed. So we're still fixing things. I'm still working on fixing things. Um, but, you know, one of the first things we do is we put on pride every year and now we're doing a couple of other projects and I've made it a mission because of what happened within the Pilates community. Um, in 2020, I can't even keep track of years. Was it 2020 that this I, I guess, uh, Michigan but, us went down? It's all kind of blending together, but yes. yeah. So when the whole thing happened with the PMA and all of that, with regard to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I was you know, running Human Rights Alliance here. Um, and I was appalled, of course, at what was going on and you know, felt responsible because I, after all, I started the organization and, um, you know, here I am. So what I, how I introduce myself when at Pride this year and when I go to speak to people is, hi, my name is Kevin Bowen. I'm the president of the Human Rights Alliance. I'm a privileged white man, and I plan on using my privilege to help those who need the help most. Love it. Love it. You know what? I'm making mistakes. So this is a learning process for me. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and after all of these years, even in my Pilates business, I, all of my clients know what I do. I talk about diversity and equity and the importance of all of that and white privilege and misunderstandings. And we have major misunderstandings in Santa Fe with the indigenous population and everything that happened there. Um, so that's something that is a really hotbed topic in this town because we have a whole uh, organization that was put under charter by the city to look at all the statues 
uh, in town, specifically the ones that are commemorating things that were awful, but we had one on the plaza and it was torn down a year ago, October, um, by a group of, yay, Nikki's back. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> by a group of demonstrators. And um, unfortunately, in my opinion, they used the opportunity to do something. I don't believe in destruction of public property. I don't really think it's a means to an end, no matter how awful and heinous um, the crime was or what was happening. And they tore it down. And actually, some of the members on the board, the younger ones, were like, oh, that's great. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. No, that shit does not fly. Well, we have other, slope. what's that? It's a slippery slope. It, it's slippery because there's other ways to get in and do this. And while it, it certainly brought attention to the matter, so I will give it that, um, the people who were implicated in this process were kind of hidden under cover. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all white, by the way. Um, and I would not call them activists. They were, you know, I don't know. Vandals? Rival rousers trying <laughs> to, you know, yeah. <laughs> So that's, you know, that's kind of where we are. Um, we have the city of Santa Fe has started this process, this charter that I talked about. It's called um, Cultural, Culture, History, Arts, Reconciliation, Truth. And it's a whole long process. It's going to take about a year where they're doing a series of public meetings to um, get the public involved and learn about the history of Santa Fe and what really happened here, which is so common across the United States how the land was taken from the indigenous tribes here, from the Apache to the Pueblo Indians, to all of them, and who are still referenced, by the way, by a, a lot of the, the long-term local folks here as being savages, um, which even some people that I know relatively well, I'm like, that's a racist term. You're using a racist term to describe people whose land was taken away from them because they fought back. Right. And, you know, I, I get a lot of strange looks from people when I start talking like that, especially other white people, because they get uncomfortable. And, you know, a gray haired white guy talking this kind of talk makes people really uncomfortable. <laughs> so I'm sure not as uncomfortable as it feels like to be a black man. But by the same token, um, you know, buttons have to be pushed. Things have to be said and the truth needs to be there. And you can't put your hands over your ears and pretend like it didn't happen. Right. Uh, here locally, there's an offshoot that's um, claiming Hispanic white privilege. And they have taken the chart acronym and they, <laughs> you're laughing. They've twisted it around to um, canceling Hispanic art, religion, and traditions. Wait, that's they're saying that's being done to them, or that is what they're trying to do? So they're saying the chart process, culture, history, art, reconciliation, truth, is really their chart is canceling Hispanic art, religion, which is the one that really gets me, and traditions. Because there are traditions that are carried on here, which are really right up against the native population, uh, celebrating the conquistadors coming in and all of the havoc they wreaked and the people they killed and the feet they cut off. Um, and yeah, sure, I mean, the people who are alive today were not involved in that, but for God's sakes, They've benefited. Um, they benefited from it. And you have to acknowledge that that was your past and that's what your, your, your ancestors did. And you can't say it's right. You I can't. have so much here that I want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. And I'm so excited that you started off with, I, I'm here and I'm making a lot of mistakes. Because this is always the place where people get hung up. I don't want to make a mistake. So I'm just going to crawl underneath my couch and just not deal with it. How did you, or what was the thought process or epiphany or whatever it is that happened in you that said, you know what, I would rather make the mistakes and get better than hang out with the dust willies underneath my couch. <laughs> I 
they call well, it. Maybe they'd rather hang out with the dogs underneath. <laughs> okay. um, well, I don't. For me, it's just kind of part of my inside being, I suppose. Um, I can't be confronted with something like this and then just step back and pretend like it didn't happen. Um, I think that's probably been a developmental problem for many of us, but for myself, I'll speak that, you know, sometimes we just kind of pretend, oh, well, you know, it's okay if we don't talk about it, like what happens in families. Because the, the standing joke when I would bring friends to my family dinners is that, oh, your family doesn't talk about anything but the weather and the potholes <laughs> on the street. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much it because we don't talk religion or politics, um, which needs to be discussed. Um, so I just thought I can't be a real person and part of me kind of wants to make some kind of difference when I'm dead, you know, after I leave, that I did something. I don't want to be, um, that would make me feel, I don't have kids, I have dogs, you know, so leaving <laughs> children as a legacy is one thing, but. Trade ya. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know, I just, it's, I, it, 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 when I tell people about, you know, why I'm doing this is because I just said, I can't, you know, when you get it all, and you see it and you then start to re-see it and see everything in your past that um, were, you know, microaggressions or examples of systemic racism and all of those things combined. For me, I have to just, I can't do that anymore. And I can't, I can't pretend like, oh, okay, like I'm not gonna put a sign up and say, oh, this is what I'm doing. I have to do it because that would be totally fucking, excuse me, disingenuous, wouldn't it? So, um, yeah, I don't know. Is that a long answer for a short question? <laughs> I don't know. No. I have a question. Oh. No, go ahead. Um, when you say that you're uncomfortable, but you may not be as uncomfortable as a black man, I guess one of my questions is, and, and, I, and I, I get the comparison, why do you feel the need to justify your 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 being uncomfortable? Um, and the reason that I'm asking is because I feel like it's like this measurement of trauma. And I don't know how you say that one person's trauma is less or more than someone else's trauma. It it has the visceral effect that it has, right? you being uncomfortable is not more or less than a black person or a brown person or a Latino person or an indigenous person. And the reason that I say this in a lot of ways, I actually think it's more because if you had to put a comparison to it, um, because you have to deal with an entire group of people who is looking at you like, dude, you're arguably the upper echelon. Sit back, cross your legs and, you know, drink wine. So I think in that respect, um, it's more uncomfortable if we were gonna measure it. Yeah, I, 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 I can say that, I mean, they're, they're right for current trauma. It could, it is uncomfortable. Um, but also, I mean, you know, Nikki, I try to use this as, um, as part of a growing process, right? So I feel like I need to be made a little uncomfortable. And by the same token, I think part of my responsibility now is to try to make others feel a little uncomfortable. Um, because I, you know, to put it very bluntly, um, I mean, I sense the uncomfortableness, but I'm not saying I'm stopping, I'm just saying I sense mm -hmm. it, right? Um, but uh, th there's, and even in our community, in the, in the, like if let's take it to the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. um, we did a drag review here, so little thing, little, we do little things to try to raise money because we don't have any money in our organization, and it's usually a charity event, right? So um, we had someone cancel last minute and um, I needed someone to fill in. And one of the performers said, oh, I know this gal. And it turns out 
we know each other. Um, she's a black uh, comedian. She, I met mm -hmm. her as a lesbian. Um, and so she, she called me up. I, I actually called her and I, she goes, oh, you know, we met each other. We started talking, we recognized each other's voices because we had met here at an event last summer. So I brought her and her humor is really pushing people's buttons, um, especially white people's buttons because she was um, a counselor and involved in, in race relations issues and things of that nature, right? Um, and so she said, well, that's what my humor is. And I said, well, that's good. Um, you know, cause I'm like, well, that's okay. And because I was hoping that the audience, because they're LGBTQ, they'd be a little bit more open to it, right? So her first set, you know, she was pointed. The second set, she got really pointed and she called um, the straight people in the room and she wasn't pointing at them, but she said, are you really an ally with our community or not? And you have to think about it. Are you just coming here to watch a drag show? Mm -hmm. um, and boy, did some white women get upset. Ooh, boy. Um, you know, I was told I was out of touch with the LGBTQ community by this one email. And that's the one I think I may have mentioned to you, Misty, where I sent her back. And I said, can you please, next time for communication purposes, tell me what your pronouns are? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I mean, really, seriously, I'm out of touch with the LGBTQ community. Um, was, was this person LGBTQ? Or um, was this a well, you know what I do, of course, when I get things like this, I look them up online and I went into Facebook. I can't tell. It looks like she is. Okay. Um, um, but I was just, you know, and I share everything with the board to let them know, you know, like there's these complaints coming in. Uh, and it made this group of LGBTQ people quite upset um, that uh, she also shared her experience on dating apps in Albuquerque, where she lives. She drove up for this event. And she, you know, cause all of the, you know, she was saying all the white women wanna, you know, meet a new black girl in town. Cause we don't have a lot of black people here in New Mexico. I'm just gonna be blunt, it's the way it is. Um, and um, so she's, she shared what people were asked her. You know, one woman said, what's it like to be black? Like what, really? I mean, so you could see the audience listening to this and, um, taking it in and it truly made them do what, you know, I always talk about when we did the other stuff at the PMA is sit on your hands because they were uncomfortable. Um, and frankly, I loved it all. I, I was the MC, so I was in the front of the room and I was uh, like egging her on. <laughs> so people were irritated, a little irritated. It was just, I knew this existed before within our community, but it was more eye-opening to see it in front of an audience with seven five people in masks, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and and people get upset with me a lot of times because, you know, our community can be quite bitchy and opinionated in a lot of ways. I've been that way sometimes, I'm gonna admit. Um, but, you know, I've said to people, you know, we eat our own, right? So if you don't like what I'm doing, you know, he's a bad guy and they, you know, people talk shit and it's like we're all on the same team people like, we're all trying to promote the same thing and come out of your little holes here um unfortunately for some you know new people into the lgbtq community the younger folks are growing up in households where things are much more open and mm -hmm. accepting um but there's still a whole group that's not experiencing that and LGBTQ mm -hmm. youth that are homeless, there's huge numbers of those mm -hmm. people in Albuquerque and in Santa Fe and their mm -hmm. parents kick them out and disown them. But it speaks to this idea that, you know, that's a really great point because the newer, gener newer generations, the younger generations who are growing up in this, what looks like a more open environment compared to the way it was even 10 years ago, you know, they don't know what it used to look like when they're learning about the AIDS epidemic and what that, how that was, they're only reading about it. They don't have that firsthand experience. So to mm -hmm. them, the struggle is not 
I don't want to say it's not a struggle, but I will say that it, the, the doors are far more open. And, you know, I wonder if that gives them a lot less, I don't want to say skin in the game, but if it makes them feel like, oh, well, we're evolving. <clears throat> when you look at civil rights, I'm sure that, you know, people born, I know well, I was born in the 70s, people born in the 70s and 80s and that had the fortune to not live in scratch my ass Texas population seven is a perfect example. You know, <laughs> what it looked like to us is very different and made it a little bit easier for us to look at our parents and be like, what, what are you talking about? Now that we're seeing what the struggle is and how much it parallels what it was, you know, we all have a responsibility to make sure it goes better. So in speaking to what you're saying, you know, we have this tendency to put people and put movements into boxes. And I, I, you got that whole firsthand experience of, well, they didn't like the box that she was talking from. And it was very, um, you know, the interesting thing is, is I, I find the dichotomy of um, black women and white women um, I find that regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of sexuality, regardless, that dichotomy is so stark to me because it was still, it, it's, it's still um, Mamie and the woman of the house. And I use a lot of slave references because that's, that's a lot of how our relationships as women, black women and white women, that's where they stem from. And so um, the, a white lesbian still is seen. She can still hide. She can still hide because she's a white woman. And that, I'm not saying that she should or that they would, and I'm not judging. I'm simply saying um, a white woman, regardless of her sexual orientation, she can still hide. She still has that protection of being a white woman. A black woman, well, we, we know how, we know where black women sit <laughs> in the ranks. And she's lesbian. Oh, well, damn, don't be butch. <laughs> so it's still that dichotomy. And it's still um, because you said the white women in the audience were all aghast, clutching their pearls. This is this woman's experience. Yes, it sounds dumb when someone says, how is it to be black? How do you answer that? <laughs> like, what? go back to the guff. Choose a new set of parents and try it for yourself. Like, how do you answer that? And then you're judged for it. Yes. What a, what an entitled place to sit, even in an other community. Well, there's a hierarchy no matter where you are. Right. And, and can we just be at the top? But I'm just, we're going to make our own hierarchy, Missy. We are at the top. Can you, can you? I mean, here we are. It, but it, it's that, is a, that is a relationship that I think needs, like, people have to step back sometimes. And that's where I think that people don't want to be uncomfortable. And because I see it even amongst my kids when I taught high school. And, uh, I, and I thought in performing arts high school, so everybody was everything at one given point in time. Um, and, but the white girls were still revered. You know, and that's, that's like, that's the thing that like, people have to take a step back and look at, it doesn't matter. That's still this sort of omnipotent place of privilege that white women get to enjoy and then they get to pick up monkey shit and throw it at other people and cause a ruckus basically. And then send emails questioning you who put together. You know, event, but <laughs> yes. I mean, to, to help your community. I mean, let's, let's not take that piece away from it. This was right. to help the community and enlighten and share all of these things and to, as Nikki so eloquently stated, throw the monkey shit at it. I'm, you know, it's, it's just so short sighted to me. Who does it help? Who gains? I, I, nobody gains from that. Um, and, and somebody, so that's me here, has to kind of step up 
and start to say things to people. Um, we have the, the issues with black and white and multiracial and all of those things. And we also have the issue within the LGBTQ communities because you know that um, the guy who wrote the architect for the Texas abortion law is now working on something for same-sex marriage. And yes. So, and these are happening across the country. I'm sorry to interrupt, but did you know he's a 37-year-old virgin? See. I don't know how that doesn't surprise he, me. But. I mean, when, when you see him, I mean, it makes sense. That I should just be criteria. Like, it should be criteria before you write legislation. You have to have Done. Some kind of experience. Something, something with somebody. But yeah, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when I saw this guy actually talking about, you know, who he is and why he felt he was entitled enough to put forth legislation like this, he said, well, I am a 37-year-old virgin. And I, I literally toppled off of my chair. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is absolutely unbelievable to me. And that, that any woman would sign off on it. It just makes me want to just strangle somebody. But Kevin, I'm sorry. Please continue. <laughs> My, but I didn't know that. A, B, he's probably really good friends with Stephen Miller. You know, Ugh, Stephen Miller doesn't have friends. He's got like ticks. He, he, <laughs> he's got a wife. Accident. No, actually, she's worse than he is. She is a heinous soul. So they kind of intermingle together perfectly. Like a virus. Yeah. <laughs> Like a replicating virus. Let's hope that doesn't happen in reality. <laughs> yeah, right. Please don't read. Um, the, our community needs to, our, and I'm saying LGBTQ community mm -hmm. of all colors and all walks of life, need to realize that we are going to be under attack. And, you know, I wasn't active when I was a younger person, when I lived in New York in the 80s and I watched people die of AIDS. Um, I was not active, I was there. I was too busy being, you know, in retail and doing everything I did back then. And at some point in my life, when this, like I said at the beginning of this program, that I just decided that I'm gonna do this now because it's time. And I can't step aside and say, oh, somebody else is going to do it for me. I have no problem walking up. You know, we have a lot of wealthy members of the LGBTQ community that have retired here in Santa Fe. And I just ask people point blank, are you going to come and do this? Oh, no. Why? Oh, I've done that before. I said, all the more reason why you need to be here. And maybe you need to write me a check because this is what's happening. And, you know, I hate to scare people, but in my opinion, it's time for people to wake the fuck Mm -hmm. Listen to see what's going on. And if you want to sit back, I don't want to be around these you know, nebulous blobs that have nothing to do or say except drink a little wine and eat some cocktail, uh, co eat cocktails, <laughs> eat some cocktail <laughs> hors d'oeuvres. Yes, I eat my cocktails. Remember jello shots? But I digress. Okay. Ooh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tammy, are you clapping at eating your cocktails or <laughs> just kidding? Yeah. So, and, and, you know, talk about what? Talk about nothing. Where'd you go on vacation? What, you know, and what did you eat? And, um, you know, come on, people. It's time to be active on so many levels in the world right now. And if you're not active, you may end up regretting it at some point, or maybe you just won't care. I don't know. Um, maybe a big asteroid is going to come and take us all out in one fell swoop, and we don't have to worry about this. But, <laughs> but there, will all, there will always be people left. Even if that happens, there will always be people left. There will always be people who are hired, you know, hardwired to survive the apocalypse. And Share. there will still be distinction. Share. <laughs> you know, there's a few. There will always be dissension amongst the ranks because there will always be a group of people who feel like they are bigger, better, badder, more, you know. Um, I, I, that's a very, that's a hard place to be. That's a, that's a, you know, like, I, you know, reaching out to people in your community who have been there and done that. And I have to say that, you know, kind of in modern time, what was going on with the LGBTQ or the, really the gay men when HIV and AIDS came out, and it was a very specific, it was not the entirety of the community. 
and it was just mean and it was it was very disheartening it dehumanized people um and to and i was there for a smidgen of it um and um not that this was a part of the HIV. Um, a lot of people, some people know, some people don't know because uh, it was a similar attack. Um, a lot of Dahmer's victims, they were gay men. Right. Yes. And they were from the Midwest. And there was one from Chicago whose parents owned a cafe that when I danced with Joe Hall, um, we all knew the cafe. And I had people who knew him. It was the same thing. It was like, you know, there's a kid who looks obviously drugged on the street. There's something that looks wrong about it, but the police just kind of go, mm, it's a lover's quarrel. You know how those gays are, right? Mm -hmm. To experience that, to the dehumanization of someone just because of your sexual orientation, to even sit in a space where you would even allow the door to crack open to that. Right, right. That level of dehumanization and tribalism too. Yeah. It's, you know, we have missing children out there, missing people out there, but we don't care about them as much as others because they don't look like us. Mm -hmm. You wonder why we're yeah. so divided. We can't be anything more than divided if this is the mindset. I'll right. let them handle their problems over there. And if they splash upon me a little bit, if they get my Louis Vuitton bag a little bit swampy, I'm going to be upset. And then I will deign to get involved. That's a problem. And the fact is, the LGBTQ community can be interchanged with any other community of people that are other. And so if within these communities, we're not looking and saying we need to reach out to those communities because in the end, we're all still under the same boot, then we're never, ever going to advance. How can we? Right. I, I, with regard to AIDS, I mean, how long has AIDS been around? And how there's still not a vaccine. Around? There's still not a cure. I mean, there's certainly medication um, and it's not as big a priority as it used to be. I mean, at least now they've solved the problem because you can take medication and uh, stay healthy, uh, which of course feeds the pharmaceutical companies and gives them lots, right. lots of money because the medication is between 1500 and $2,000 a month period in order to stay alive. Um, so you've got those things that happened and then as the community aged, you know, I, I, I am considered an older member, but as the community aged, when I go back to what we were talking about with the younger generation, they don't know everything that happened. They don't understand it. Um, and, and then within our community alone, you've got the whole issue with the trans folks and how they're treated, especially black trans women. Um, and it's appalling. It's appalling. Members of our community, you know, no, I don't, you know, I don't understand it. Um, it's not a drag show. Why do they have to uh, be that way? Right, right. It's, um, you know, that's really too uncomfortable for me. Um, I mean, and I, there was a time, right? Uh, and what was that? God forbid I even like some gay members of our community, LGBTQ, don't even want to be friends with drag queens because that's a whole different thing. And then, you know, we've got the trans community and that's something totally different. Well, at the end of the fucking day, they're all people, right? We're all humans and we will accomplish a lot more together, but boy, is it a struggle sometimes to get people to just, you know, listen and um, talk and, you know, to circle back a little bit, I know when I walk in to talk to people, the kind of presentation that I can make. And if I put a suit on as a white guy with gray hair, people listen to me. And now, and earlier in my life, I knew how to use that to my advantage. And so 
I've been schooled in doing that, so good. I can go in and do it. I can walk into any legislation. I'm going to be getting involved this coming year. I'm actually going to be working with the League of Women Voters on a special project they're doing to help get people involved in democracy. Uh, they got a grant here in the state of New Mexico, so I'm going to be a facilitator with them. Um, and, you know, for me, like, if you go back and ask me, why are you doing this or what, you know, what involved you? I mean, this is stuff I've not done before. So I'm learning more and more and getting involved with people and being able to go out and speak and talk and be able to maybe convince some white people here and some Hispanic folks here that, listen, I'm not coming after you, but let's just talk and let's look at the reality of a situation. I don't want to take your culture and your traditions away, but you have to recognize where they came from. And there's got to be a way for us to make this all inclusive. Um, and you know, when the conquistadors came into New Mexico, there were several of the Pueblos and the different tribes here who um, revered Two-Spirit, which is someone who it, born one sex and it shows qualities of both sexes sometimes in the native community two-spirit just means you're part of the lgbtq community or sometimes a two-spirit is someone who lives as the other sex mm -hmm. um they were revered as being yeah. you know almost clairvoyant and spiritual um and the elders worked with them but once the conquistadors and the effing catholics came which Jesus. you know they Boshed all of that and pushed it all down. And, you know, I say the Catholics, um, I was raised Catholic kindergarten <clears throat> through 12th grade. That's my, you know, religion that I was baptized into. Um, but there's a lot of problems with it. And yes. people are still defending Catholicism here in Santa Fe because the archdiocese, which is here in town, is in bankruptcy because of all of the lawsuits they've had because of molestation and all the other issues. That but we gone. can't ever talk about that because, you know, that was a few bad apples. We always get back to this few bad apples discussion. Right. You know, it, it doesn't matter if it's two or 12. At the end of the day, if apples aren't eradicated, then your whole damn bushel rots. Well, but it's a little... few bad apples across the globe. That's the thing. The, the whole it's place. not just like one section. It's literally worldwide. And even well, if you didn't engage in that behavior, if you saw it happening and you chose to stand back and say, oh, someone else is going to get it, you yeah. are just as bad an apple as the perpetrator, especially yes. when you're talking about abusing children for the love of Pete. And shifting. Oh, let's move this guy over here. Oh, let's move this guy over here. Oh, and, that's still too close. But let's move way over there. About the whole historical piece about it and, you know, revering our history and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. You know what? At the end of the day, and I, I, I say this all the time, it's like if we're supposed to be growing and evolving, then we should grow enough to know that when we look at our history and our history is shit, then we have a responsibility to look at it objectively and see what needs to go. You know, you, you can't say that the conquistadors were, I, mean, I remember being in school and I remember being like, you know, if I was born back then, I'd be a conquistador because, you know, I like to kick ass and I look great in gold, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, they were never framed as pirates. Bad guys, right. What, what they were, they raped right. and stole. You know, right. there's nothing romantic about anything that the conquistadors did. And it needs to change. The, the issue, too, with the conquistadors, if you look back, and because I, I started to look at some of the history and I need to do a deeper dive, but um, the, the way that the Spaniards had set up that time when they went to conquer nations, um, what, there was a very specific protocol for going in on other people's land. And you were supposed to integrate, is what they had written. And of course, someone decided that integration meant whatever it meant, which would mean making the Indians slaves, um, living next to them. Some of them did that. Um, then when there was the revolt, then of course they came back and they had to you know, take everything back because those savages 
revolted. Well, because we've we, given the savages and they, yeah. how dare we, they revolt. And we've got to go back and get them and make them all Catholics. Cause you know that all the Pueblos here, a large majority of them all have Catholic churches on them. Yes. That was part of the whole mm -hmm. deal, right? Um, and one other little bit of trivia, I don't want to bash Santa Fe. I love the area and I love being here and doing what I'm doing. But um, there were two facilities here in New Mexico that were kind of the Betty Ford clinics for the Catholic Church that the archdiocese ran all of the problem priests and nuns through to go to these two facilities. One is called the Servants of the Pericles and the other one get a load of this name, Our Lady of Blood. Mm -hmm. So these two places, these very damaged individuals went for rehabilitation, but they were rehabilitated by other Catholic priests and nuns who were not versed or knowledgeable in that. I know this because my friend who was handling some legal issues with that, and I also have another friend who was a doctor here who was actually called to go medically treat them, but they wouldn't take psychiatric. So, you know, this kind of intrinsic just stuff um, has been happening. And if it's happened here, God, it's, you know, it's been happening everywhere. We know this, right? Um, and a lot of these men that were brought out here were pedophiles. And they were, you know, would be considered part of the LGBTQ community, some of them. And some of them were also uh, uh, having women as victims, kids as victims, you know. Can you explain, can you explain that? Because I don't, I, I didn't understand that being a pedophile was about your sexuality. So can it's, you explain? It's not, I mean, but, but there is, what I'm saying is there's some men who were pedophiles who preferred sex with men or boys. Okay. Yeah, that's all I'm saying with that. Okay. It, it, it's not- Be Because I feel like people do that. I yeah. feel like people already say, oh, well, if he's, if he's in a religious organization and he's gay, he's gonna be a pedophile. And I'm like, um, no, I don't no. think it works like that. No. So but I was just asking for clarity. So you're not saying that- No, no, no. Okay. No, I mean, the perhaps maybe what I might be referencing here is if there hadn't been such repression with these right. individuals that maybe they would have made better choices with things. Look, I went to Catholic school. I just told you my whole early school upbringing. Um, I knew of one priest that in high school that was carrying on with some of the boys. Um, and I'm not saying it was a healthy relationship, but they were old enough. The boys were, had already made their decision that they were, wanted to be involved with men. And the priest actually was not even a Jesuit. He happened to be someone who was teaching at the school where I was going. Um, and it wasn't right. I didn't see them together. So should have I had said something? No, because and I'll be honest here, um, he was a good looking man. And I was also gay at that point, just didn't know it. And you know, you kind of think, oh, I'd like to have, you know. But Kevin, weren't you also a kid? Yes. Okay. 16. So we're going, we, yeah, we can stop that not, right there. You can just, <laughs> like you're sitting here analyzing a decision that you could have, should have, would have made as a yeah. kid. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. No. So <laughs> you, you can. <laughs> Like, you're all like, you know, and when I but, was, you know. 30, but the side of me, I never saw them together, so I couldn't make any decisions like that. But, but. This is your rational, very adult mind saying this. That was not your, you, you at the age of 16, who, what was going on in your mind and what are all of the many hormones. Right. right. So many things. So, too many hormones <laughs> in an all boys school. Liking boys, what, like what do you think? And you're trying to do the responsible thing and analyze that. And you know, <laughs> well, I didn't see them together. <laughs> you know? Nah. I, I did nah. tell a couple of priests off once, but you know that was um, that's something that, that was very age appropriate. That 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 lacked full on frontal lobage. That was yeah. very age appropriate. Yeah. I 
You know, so since you said that, you know, since you're holding your 16 year old self accountable for, <laughs> um, what, what maintains your steadfastness? How do you, what do you do to stay in the game? Because you're not just in one very specific game. And it's like, you're like, oh, I need it over here. So let me go do this thing over here with, you know, the Women's Voting League. And, oh, wait, over here, there's some, you know, puppies. I'm going to go do over there. How do you maintain yourself? Because um, you look fabulous, you always do. But how do you maintain yourself? How do you do you? Yeah, and I want to frame that a little bit tighter too. One of the things that we continually hear, especially me and my beyond the bullshit work that I do, is oh, I I just am so tired. Like I can't I can't even think about it because I'm tired. I can't talk about uh, racism. I can't talk about any isms because I'm exhausted. But you, my friend, you, you don't look tired. I mean, <laughs> you look exuberant. I and I swear, like I, I, I've just gotten to know you better over the past eighteen months. But I mean, even like one hundred fifty years ago, when I first started to see you and know who you are, I mean, you have lost no steam, energy, gas. You haven't aged a second. I'm sure your suit collection is still on point. How have you managed? <laughs> I always find a way to work his suits in the conversation because I've got to tell you, this man can dress. But what is that elixir that you're drinking? I yeah, see you. What are you? What is that? Will you bottle it because I am tired. <laughs> I'm tired too. I mean, frankly, I'm tired, and sometimes I don't even know which end is up. Um, it's kind of just the way that it is. Hi, everybody. Um, and I just keep going, and thank God I have a partner who puts up with all of this and allows me and helps me do all of the stuff that I do. But um, I don't know, I, I feel a, when I do this human rights work, I just feel energized about the whole thing and it makes me feel good. Um, so that, that's about as honest as I can be about all of that, right? Um, uh, yeah, I've aged, what are you talking about? I work out every day, I try to do, I try to keep myself in shape um, I, I try to be kind to myself and, um, and then I do sit down with myself and have a talk from time to time and be like, you know, you're really not taking care of yourself enough. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I do certain things like after all of this today, I'm going to go have a facial. She keeps me looking. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's part of the stuff, but, um, I think I, there's a bit of I just want, good spirit in that too. I, yeah. I want to thank both of you because you've, um, you two um, have been uh, a great learning experience for me. <laughs> pew, pew. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good to hear it. <laughs> it, <laughs> it. Well, it's been enjoyable. It's been, and... Um, uh, right, Harmony? <laughs> Harmony's yeah. on it, yes. I would love to age like Kevin, too. Something I, tells me it's not just that. Somewhere. It's I'm, not just that facial. That's right, but... But you know what? It must be good living too. I mean, he's in Santa Fe. He's like, yeah. he's getting the sun. I mean, mm -hmm. come on. But thank you, Kevin. You know, it's it's been a really good experience for us too because, you know, it's not easy to talk about these things. And, yeah. you know, before last year, I will tell you honestly, and you've probably experienced this with bringing up LGBTQ issues, people just don't really want to talk about it. And it's kind of that, you know what? I don't talk about things that could be political. So, mm -hmm. and you know, we just with this platform have just decided that if it's important, we're going to talk about it. And if it's important to us, we're going to talk about it. And I feel like issues like these, again, rather than punting them forward for the next generation to have to handle, right. why can't we be the adults in the room and start working on it? Right now. And um... today. Today, two things. One is I only have an hour, so I have a client coming in in a moment. Okay. But I look at it this way. Um, I said earlier that I would like to make some kind of difference with what I'm doing. And it's kind of, I'm looking at this the same way that I teach instructors to be Pilates teachers, is that if you can make a difference in one person's life that's really life-changing, then that's good. 
that's a really good thing you did. If you can make it in multiple people's lives, then that's even better. But, um, you know, I, I, I uh, my attitude is just, I, I want to keep doing this and I don't feel like, let's put it, let me rephrase that. I feel like if I stop, I'll lose something. Mm. And I, that, I, I feel like that would really take my spirit completely down and I wouldn't be true and honest and I like to try to live up to my word if I say I'm going to do something I'm going to fucking do it and I don't want someone to walk up and say well you know you're all talk and you just no action um, I don't want to be like that now in the process sometimes of making things happen like I'm trying to do here with nothing we use smoke and mirrors to make things be a little bit bigger than they are and to get the word out um but that's what I would just say to, to everyone. I'm, I just try to bring people along a little bit for the ride and to kind of, you know, learn something. And maybe if I don't change your mind, maybe, maybe Nikki will change your mind or maybe Misty will change your mind or maybe Susie or somebody else. Right. But maybe you'll remember and go, oh, I remember Kevin said something about this before. Or I, you know, I lit a little fire and maybe it will, you know, make people think, um, you know, and to me, this, the Human Rights Alliance that I run here in Santa Fe, um, it's a mission. Um, we have a mission to do some work and human rights are everyone's rights. Um, I have a t-shirt that says um, equal rights for everyone does not mean less rights for you. It's not pie. It's not pie. It's not pie, baby. Okay. I love you both. Thank you very much for- Thank you, Kevin. Thank here. you, Kevin, for jumping in. And we really appreciate it. And please keep up the work you're doing. If there's anything that we can promote that you're doing. I'll let you know. Out. We have 100%. something to next June, but I'll tell you. Perfect. All right. We're okay. ready for it. Thanks, Kevin. Thank, Thank you. Kevin, so much. Enjoy your Bye -bye. week. Bye-bye. That was so good. That was. I mean, I just love it. Let's see. Tate says, a lot of people don't have the courage to speak on certain things. Plus, some people don't like to stir the pot. They like peace. But whatever is at the bottom is going to get scorched. A hundred percent. And and that's kind of where we are right now, right? It's It's the bottom of the pot is scorched to the point where Okay, so everybody knows that I have the attention span of a deer at a tick convention, or a tick at a deer convention. And so I, I get a little bit distracted. And one day I decided I was gonna make tea in my glass teapot. And like 40 minutes later, I smelled this horrible smell and it was because I melted the teapot to the cooktop because I completely <laughs> forgot about it. That's what happens when you put things off to later or you allow yourself to be distracted. You know, everybody has forgotten about the fact that, that these people over here on the margin need to be attended to. And when you leave things off in the margin in another room behind the door uh, and you're three flights up, you're going to forget about that. And the tea pot might get scorched. And then what happens? Well, and I also think that people like to, for sure, skirt the issue. And so when you don't deal with conflict, however that is, mm -hmm. and conflict, I think the word conflict gets a bad rap. Conflict doesn't have to be bad. Conflict could just be about describing a shift or a change. But when you don't address the conflict, right, it, stays and it may seem to so your baby goes poop in their diaper and you go we are mm. drilling it with these images today <laughs> like mm. and you put the baby down for a nap in their crib in another room you go into the kitchen to have your tea well you escape the conflict for a moment but now it's two hours later and that poop has ripened and it has festered and it has sweat. 
And it's climbed up their back because it's it has a bigger. The to conflict the didn't, right, like. right. It didn't go away. It escalated. And that's what emotional conflict does as well. It stays on the fringes. So for the people who are sitting there going, oh my gosh, I know someone else is really going to deal with all of this, you know, this human sex trafficking. I know someone is. It stays because the, the human traffickers are relying on exactly that mentality. Yeah. They are relying on the fact that someone, a lot of someone's are going to say it's someone else's problem. Um, not a, a Ooh, rehab. That's a, a dramatic pod. No, repeat well, that. I lost you. Oh, no one in our, in our little city town wants a rehab, like a drug rehab. But everybody in the city of Chicago knows it's all the suburbanite kids who are crossing the heroin highway, which is the highway that you take to get from my town to the city they were all coming from the suburbs and it's like well that's great you can send little susie or little johnny off secretly but when little susie and little johnny end up in one of the same facilities as half of their high school class jig is up <laughs> secrets out so the conflict doesn't go away it it's it simmers it stews it festers it continues to grow. And so thinking that, you know, I think Kevin's point was profound. Everything that we're discussing is human rights because everything that we're discussing is, is a group of people deciding how someone's humanness should look. And not their humanity, but you're a human and I don't like how you're packaged. And the way you treat the people on the bottom speaks to the health of your society. Yes. The way you treat the downtrodden, the way you look at the homeless, the yes. way you characterize the people in, in your mind who don't have employment or living in their car or whatever it is, that, that speaks to the health of your society. And if you don't want to believe me, take a look at what we're dealing with right now. Taking care of your fellow citizens by doing the most basic things <clears throat> is egregiously disgusting to people. The fact that people have left their jobs in retail and fast food for their own safety has been turned into a big economics issue based on people wanting uh, welfare and wanting uh, and unemployment. And uh, now the unemployment benefits are gone and nobody is going back to their jobs. So that has to be reframed. So then well, you know, it's the other, other interesting. Blame it on. The other interesting thing is all of a sudden, all of these people who, who um, paying $15 an hour was going to bankrupt them and put them out of business. And people, 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 I am not talking about mom and pop small business. I'm not. Mom and pop small business is sometimes two nickels and a threadbare penny and some string and a little spool of thread. I am not, I am talking about chain stores. Now all of a sudden they can afford $15 an hour. And a signing bonus. How insulting right. is that? Now, all of a sudden, because we're not talking about years later. We're not, we're talking about a year ago. Because Illinois, I believe, is supposed to move up to $15 an hour in another two, three years. If somebody's from Illinois on and if you want to um, correct that. But I don't think we're at the, the required uh, having to be at um, minimum wage as $15 an hour yet. I think it's another uh, year or two. And the irony of that is... Um, we're talking about, it was something like a four or five year difference, this, this scaling up. So we're talking about a four or five year difference, but everything scales up. So now that $15 an hour pew, pew, pew. is still, is still, and I'm like, and so on NPR, they talk about how rent has gone up. Well, and that's the thing, the punt 
the punting that people have done, now we are in a crisis because inflation is at a 30 year high. It has not been this high for 30, since the 90s, the early 90s, which means again, what is that $15 an hour worth? $8.12 or something like that. I just made that. Right. Joke. But I mean, so again, we have punted, but we punted at the wrong time. We punted too late. We're in the midst of a supply chain crisis in a huge part because right. again, people aren't working. Thank you, Harmony. Yeah. So, oh my gosh. So we're still three years away. Again. So and, and the reason why they create that big of a space, let's be honest, they create that big of a gap from the time they sign the legislation to the time it matures because they're giving other administrations, whatever it is, time to find a way out of it. Yeah. They're uh, and always looking for a reason to backtrack. And when we punt forward, we put ourselves in a position where we might as well just be waiting for that rollback. And it's with everything, right? And so, of course, we know, um, not, not OPEC, um, what is it called? Um, the climate change. Now OPEC is in my head and it's not OPEC. I know what you mean. The, the, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. G. G so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, G20. so you have something. Yeah. So you have all of these countries um, that are now, right now, they are being impacted by climate change. G10, G20, um, they're being impacted by climate change. And apparently when Obama was in office, there was supposed to be- p 26 Yes. There was supposed to be some billions of dollars sent and spread out to these smaller countries who are right now being impacted. They're I mean, we, we know this, right? Haiti can't win for freaking losing. No. I mean, every time Haiti just tries to just, let me get my foot up on the, you know, here comes another something or other, right? Still just weird that the I Dominican... The Dominican just doesn't get it like Haiti, and they're literally on the same. Okay. The fault line. They're right I know. The fault line. But, oh, stop talking science, Misty. How dare you? How dare you? It's just, <laughs> it's just flatter on the Damn other it. side. It's flat. So, but John Kerry is like, um, he's singing the praises of this deal, this agreement that came through. And these countries are like, no, no, it's not. They're like, you caused this. The U S is 40% responsible for what is going on. And again, the, the time to reach certain milestones, never mind the fact that we've already past the time for other milestones. Um, bye, Georgina. Um, the, the, the time is out to like, we want everybody to be in electric cars by 2030. Eight years is a long time to do significant damage. Nobody wants to say, hey, trade in the car that you have right now for an electric car. Let's just do an even swap. Well, even if, if they wanted to say it, you can't get a car right now. There's no parts. Oh, that's right. And there's... <laughs> I mean, so. yes, you're, you're spot on right. But what's worse about what you're saying is that these big countries are saying, well, okay, this is what needs to happen worldwide for things to change. When you have these developing nations who are just trying to catch up, they're doing things that we did 150 years ago and during industrialization and all of that. And to hold these developing nations to these same standards is completely absurd, especially considering that it's the corporations that are in the developing nation, I mean, in the developed nations, going and raping and pillaging the resources Correct. of the developing nations. You can't say that it's fair because we've decided it needs to change now. Right. That's not right. the way to do it, but uh, right. alas, again, leaving people on the margins, people who can't afford right. to play on the world stage, they get 
a shit sandwich with a side of fries. Right. GMO fries. <laughs> and it's, you know, from water. I'm not sure if you guys are uh, current or if you've heard. A judge just approved a $600 million settlement for Flint, Michigan. Um, I didn't have time to listen to the whole thing, but a lot of the money is um, on uh, for kids because we know what lead does to kids, especially in the developmental stages. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have um, those who did not want to be a part of the larger lawsuit, they are free to go on their own. But you still have something. Flint is seven, almost eight years old. And Flint's not the only city that was as bad as Flint. Correct. It's just Correct. The, the most notoriety. Yeah. Did you? Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. There, so I know that one of the one of the um, the judges approved one of the uh, one of the approved settlements from the judges six hundred million, and I and I just go is $600 million a lot of money? Oh my God, $600 million? Of course it's a lot of money. No, it's not. 40% but, it goes to the... Industry. No, no. But it's not a lot for that circumstance. That's not exactly my point. It's, yeah. And I'm like, these were... Because they still have to change the infrastructure. Yep. You know, they still have to change the infrastructure um, in, in so many different places. And I can tell you when that story broke um you know everybody knows when you live in chicago um if they come to pave your street you know your neighborhood's about to get gentrified hmm. um so um they changed out our water pipes i remember right after my son we and we had always used bottled water especially after the boys were born but i remember them coming and it was really weird because um it was like maybe two weeks notice. I mean, you're talking for a major change in the infrastructure of a community, digging through like nobody could park on the streets, digging through, changing all the water lines. We got about two weeks notice. And I remember when that happened and I remember they were like, they were like in there and they were working. You didn't see anybody sitting down, even trying to take a lunch, eat a sandwich or, you know, do something like random that they're not supposed to be doing. You saw these guys in and they were just going block by block by block, changing those pipes. Cause it's, you know, in Chicago was like, yeah, I'm not making no money. We too busy paying for our governors. That are in jail. Oh, geez. That's sad. Oh, uh, that's sad. <laughs> oh, cause you know, like, two or three of our governors have been in jail and, you know, a, a police sergeant. Yeah. You know, yeah. so talk about um, it's <laughs> yeah. So it's all of those things that it's about treating people like humans. And you said it best, the lowest, the least, um, who the, the those who have the least access, you know, how are you treating your lesser than, not lesser than because they're less of a person, but because of their circumstances? How are you treating them? You're treating them or of a person. Right. And, you know, we talk about this with race. You'll hear me say um, some people, some, some ethnicities, some cultures don't go beneath their shade of brown. You have to go to who is considered the darkest because if you can get to the person on the bottom, then that will feed up. That will push up. Yeah, trickle down. Trickle down. I mean, no, but definitely feeding from the ground level up. We see it. Plants grow yeah. up. They don't fall from yeah. the sky. If they're falling from the sky, you should probably go inside. Something bad is happening. <laughs> <laughs> trickle down is a myth that doesn't work and we know and it just it sounds bad because it's not even like downpour down it already starts it's with a trickle i mean think about it though think about think about this imagery so it's if it's trickling down from way up and you think about you know like gravity evaporation friction <laughs> By the time you get down to the bottom, there's nothing left. There's the nothing mess. left. There's no atoms left. It's just gone. How, who, 
spot. It's a mess. It's a good idea. Is this like the top layer might get a little misty, <laughs> but not me. But, but it's not. It's not like downpour down. No, they already. It's already diminished. <laughs> so we want to push up from the bottom. We want to grow from the bottom or you want to bubble up from the bottom, however you want to do it. But then that, when you anchor from the bottom, you get this beautiful support. We know this. We know that we cannot anchor from the top. We know this, you know. And, and when you support all of your people, look, the Chinese government is the Chinese government. It does what it does. <laughs> But hot damn, they have slapped that COVID back. <laughs> they shut down Disneyland. <laughs> you know it's bad when they're shutting down Disneyland. I mean, that's when shit's getting real. And they found that person too. <laughs> it's actually amazing. But, you know, again, it goes to show what can be done when there's a will. Yes. And, you know, when there's not direction. Be like cheerleading for the, the Chinese government. But no, they were like, listen, we want to get our economy back. We want to get people back to work. We are going to do this. So this is what we're going to do. And people say, oh, that's terrible. It's authoritarian, blah, blah, blah. To me, what's authoritarian is sending people back to work when we know it's not safe for them to go there. Because if they don't go there, they're going to lose their house. If you it's think that that's freedom. I don't know. Well, it's a, is it authoritarian? It's like, why is Colorado in the midst of an uptick for COVID? You know, I mean, the, and, and now hospitals in Colorado are saying they're inundated once again. At this point, it's like, you know, you're just sitting there and you're just, you're sitting there and you're just getting slapped across the face and you're like, and then you stop and you breathe for a minute and you just sit there and the dude's like, you can get up and leave anytime you want to. You can wear a mask. Yes, I'm going to say you should get vaccinated. I'm always going to say you should get vaccinated. Why? Because my father-in-law is a survivor of polio. I'm glad my kids don't have to go through that. I'm always going to say that. I'm never going to change my mind. Did it mean I just blindly went in? No, you, you've seen um, Tasha on here. Tasha's a farm D. She, she came in and she talked to us about COVID. I don't want my kid on a ventilator. I don't want my dad on a ventilator. But at the end of the day, you literally cannot just sit there and act like you don't know what's going on when you don't want to be a part of the solution, even if the solution is wear a mask. At the end of the day, when things don't work, you have to be dynamic of thought enough to make change. You have to change. You have to be willing to change. You have to, it's, it's like anything else. It's like when your kid is just really struggling with something like cleaning their room, <laughs> you know, what would happen if your kid's room looked like the Lindbergh baby was missing in there, the abominable snowman and T-Rex? Would you allow that to continue or would you enact change? You know, it's, it's an overly simplistic statement when it comes to governance, but at the same time, again, you have to be thinking about what's going to help everyone at large not just the people that are lining your pockets. When it comes to social justice and civil rights, you have to help the people that are most likely to be left behind because when they're left behind, what are they going to do? Well, they're certainly not just gonna sit in the hole and sing all by myself. No. They're <laughs> yeah, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna do that. And what they're going to do is, we are humans in our nature, in our instinct. We struggle or strive to survive. So they're going to do what it takes to survive. Pissed off about crime? Maybe you should consider that when you're looking at people, looking down on people that don't have as much as you do. And don't but get at wrong, the, uh, there are always going to be criminals. But that's not what I'm talking about here. But at the end of the day, 
that we're not a month into this. We're, we're really two years into this because we, we obviously, we now know that um, COVID was around long before January, February of 2020. So we know that. We know that people were going in as early as November, probably even earlier than that, right? So we're two years in. If your way is not working, <laughs> just, just, just super simplify it, right? Is your way working? If your way is not working and you're still, you just want to rip masks off. So now there's this whole big sweep in our community. Ah, let the kids be free. They don't want to wear their masks. Let them, you uh -huh. know, let them go back to normal. I don't want to wear pants. And I'm like. I'm wearing and, pants. We have one more kid that we have to get vaccinated and I have to, um, I have to navigate that because I think he still needs um, his other meningitis vaccination. I have to go back and look at that and see. Bye Tammy. Thank you. And I don't want to put those two together, but he's coming up on 12. So I have to organize that, but he's definitely going to get vaccinated. But people are asking for masks to be omitted in schools, but without any kind of proof. No, everybody wants to keep their business to themselves. And I'm like, I have zero issue. I, I have my vaccination card, um, but you can't just go for your creature comforts. I don't wanna wear a mask, but then not, be wholly applicable to the other aspect of it. But you can apparently, and that's what's <laughs> that's what the government's allowing to happen. But just remember, yes. Rome is burning. Rome is and burning. Some of y'all are sitting there roasting marshmallows and looking around to see where the bag. Who's got the bag? But you know what? I mean, <laughs> the delivery truck can't get through because there's nobody to drive it. So you're not going to have marshmallows for long. And then I'm just saying. I'm just saying, we got to think a little bit deeper. We've got to be broader minded and we've got to remember again, it may not affect you yet, but it will. And when it does, I mean, don't be crying in your Wheaties because you had plenty right. of opportunity to make change happen before. You had plenty of opportunity to be a part of the, the, the solution and you chose. It is a choice. Right. It is a choice. It is, and it should be a human choice collectively. Um, and, it, 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 and it shouldn't be the individual. And again, we live in communities. We, we, communities, there, there must be an inherent barter system. And part of that bartering in, in that basic underlying foundation is the community must work as a collective, as a group. Right. You cannot take the paved roads and the fancy suburb subdivision and the fancy grocery stores. You cannot expect those without having to be accountable for the community. The autonomy is the issue. It should simply be what is best for my community? Oh. But I'm going to I'm going to remain optimistic, Misty. Have at it. <laughs> you, I mean, you're great at it so far. I'm going to <laughs> remain with my plants <laughs> because my plants. I mean, they let me down all the time. Actually, <clears throat> you don't even know what happened to Rufus. I mean, I managed to raise Rufus from the dead, but it was pretty rough for a minute. But I'm just saying. Like, I appreciate anybody that can be very positive about it, but let's see, if the virus was a country, right. wouldn't we be at war with it? Oh, I could talk about that forever because the answer is yeah. That's what we do in America. We blow shit up. But we would be at war with it and we would be at war with all of its little baby islands that would circle the country. But it all goes back to community. It all goes back to not caring about the, the, the bottom rungs of your community is what it comes mm -hmm. down to. That's what uh -oh. it goes back to. Because you know what, uh -oh. Brian, Come on, Brian. say this and then we got to shimmy. But I will say this. When it was 
thought that COVID was a, a generalized pall on the world. We were shut down. We were doing all these things to make sure that everybody was safe. The minute it was turning out to only hurt certain communities or certain hurt certain communities that were considered to be expendable, the minute that was solidified, then it was let's reopen. And now we have a situation where it's plucking people off here and there and everywhere. You can't put the genie back into the bottle. The genie right. is running out. The genie has no pants. It's having a great time. And there's no bringing the community back into the bottle. So I'm back. That's, I'm back. It, that, that's what's happened. So, you know, now we're in this situation where they can't reverse it. And then what do you have? So in trying to protect certain people and not protect others, they've let the genie out of the bottle. We need to remember that. We need to remember that for the next time this happens. We should learn something and know better moving forward. Yes. And yes. that's us as citizens. Forget the government. That's us as citizens. We mm -hmm. should know better. We should be looking out for our neighbors. We should be looking out for our friends, our kids in school, our communities. Yes. That's our responsibility as citizens. Love. We did it. Today. It is. We did. We did. That was that. awesome. Kevin, I know you're teaching. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you long haulers that have been with us since 1.30. And uh, if you're just popping in now, sorry, catch the replay. It was actually a really good conversation. And um, in the meantime, next Thursday night, we're back. Thursday yes. night. I don't know what the date is. I, ne I never know what date it is, but it's next Thursday night. And um, <clears throat> that is November 18th. November 18th. That's the Thursday before Thanksgiving. So it is. Technically, we are scheduled for the Friday after Thanksgiving. Indeed. So if you're not sitting rubbing your belly. No, if you are sitting <laughs> rubbing your belly, what else this are you going to do? Prop your device. That's I'm right. Just wedge it right in. <laughs> have some snacks. Just saying. So two Fridays from now, but next Thursday, if you can join us, yes. 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Middle of the country time, wherever that is. And uh, we would love to have you join us on that time at that time. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks, today. guys. And uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Damn, I never. <laughs> but that's the fun part. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> it's like the secret hidden ending after the credits. That's right. You're like waiting for the next, the next episode.